So thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, this is a wonderful conference, and you have a gem of an institute here. It's been a real pleasure to be here. I, I just want to say I, I caught a bad cold last night, so I might uh, waver at some point, and my thinking might not be completely clear, but I'll try to make it through uh, the next 40 or so minutes. So before I sort of dived, dove, dived, that's what happens when you get a cold. You can't remember how to speak English. But anyway, before I get into the physics, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, our university, sort of in the spirit of what Fateme did yesterday, because maybe not many of you have been there. So um, we, we are a college that was founded a rather long time ago um, to educate the local population, the Native Americans. And this is what it looks like from the air. So we are relatively isolated. We are surrounded by forest. Uh, we're in the state of New Hampshire, which is about 85% forest, and my house is somewhere over there. And when I go for walks in the woods, sometimes I encounter bear, bears and deer. So it's, it's a little bit wild. By the way, this is sort of designed to encourage you to visit, and I'm not doing a good job, but I'll try to do a better job. So geographically, this is where we're located. So you've all heard of Boston, you probably know where it is, and also Montreal, which is up here. So we're roughly halfway between these two fine cities. We're right on the border between New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, you might have heard of Vermont because Bernie Sanders, the only socialist member of uh, the US Senate, comes from that state. Uh, but we're slightly in New Hampshire, which is a little bit more conservative. I, I don't want to go into politics because we'll never stop. <laughs> So our department is called the Wilder Laboratory. And uh, one thing that we, are, we, we have a kind of a, in our history is, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but in 1901, um, the first accurate measurement of the pressure of light on a macroscopic object was performed there. And this is actually something that we've heard a lot about in many of the talks here, the application of the pressure of light to various physics. Now, I just wanted to show you some of the faculty in our department. In fact, all the faculty, but it just takes two pages. Um, so uh, we have some cosmologists, Robert Caldwell, Marcelo Gleiser. Uh, we've also got um, several people working in quantum information science and cosmology, Roberto Nofrio, Shekhar Ramanathan, Alex Rimberg, uh, a recent arrival, James Whitfield, uh, Kevin Wright, a low-temperature person, and Lorenzo Viola. If you do come, and you're welcome to come, especially the undergraduates who might be considering PhDs, make sure if you arrive in the winter that you dress warmly, because it can get rather cold there. So this was uh, from 2015, uh, where it was about minus 25 Fahrenheit. I can't convert it into centigrade, but if it was minus 40, it's very easy. It's minus 40 in both, both uh, scales. OK, enough about the place. What is the question that I, I'm interested in, I've been thinking about for a while? Well, it's something that's also been discussed in several other talks here, and that is, does the quantum superposition principle apply to arbitrarily large energy and mass scales? And more so, does gravity play a possible role in limiting the quantum classical divide? So just to begin, I'd like to give you a snapshot of three relatively recent experiments that have been testing the superposition principle for arbitrary various mass objects and various separations. So this was an uh, experiment from Mark Kazovich's group not so long ago. Um, this is essentially a Mach Zender interferometer where they're, where they're um, using lasers, pressure of light as beam splitters and mirrors, to um, get a rubidium-87 atom to interfere with itself. And in this paper, they were able to demonstrate uh, superpositions of this rubidium-87 atom with itself uh, up to half a meter. Now, how much is half a meter? Does anybody have a, a rough sense? Yes. You can use your arm and a piece of chalk. But I'd just like to kind of make this more visceral. So I think this is roughly half a meter. So let me just draw an axis here. What am I using for my scale? This is a psi of z. This is z. So this wave function that they were creating looks roughly like this. 
Okay, this is a little bit less than half a meter, but you get the idea. So they had a rubidium 87 atom in two places at once to use uh, everyday language. Now, I'm expressing this uh, mass in terms of a multiple of the mass of a nucleon. So think of this as the mass of a neutron. You'll see why shortly. Let's consider another experiment, one that you're actually very familiar with, because Marcus Arndt talked about this uh, just a few or so days ago. So of course, they're working with uh, molecules that are much larger in, ter in the mass than the rubidium 87 atoms. So the, the current record in their, in their lab is about 10 to the 4 times the mass of the nucleon. If you try to extract a kind of a measure of the separation of the, of the states in the superposition, you can rough, go roughly with a slit spacing. It's, it's about 260 nanometers. So notice the trend. As we test ever larger objects currently, we're, we're kind of going to smaller superposition uh, distances in terms of what's been achievable so far. So the last snapshot of an experiment I wanted to tell you about is uh, this one done uh, in John by John Teufel, right here, and Conrad Lehnert. And so in contrast to the previous two experiments, um, we don't have a free atom or a free molecule. You actually have a, a, something that's tethered. It's a harmonic oscillator. And so the mass is, is, is this, it's a bit like a, a drum, which is oscillating up and down. And it's made from aluminum aluminium, depending on which country you live in. And it's about uh, 10 or so micrometers across. And if you work, calculate how much mass is in this thing, it's about 10 to the 13 times the mass of the nucleon. Of course, much larger than in Marcus Arndt's experiments, but also the, the, the separation and the superposition that they are able to achieve is, is somewhat less. Okay? So this, this is the current state of the art in experiment in terms of testing the superposition principle in quantum mechanics. What about gravity? How might gravity affect the ability to make superpositions of, of say, position or energy states? Well, it's appropriate in thinking about gravity to, to actually discuss the very first experiment where gravity played a role in quantum mechanics. And this is the famous experiment of uh, Kalella, Overhauser, and Werner, affectionately known by the acronym CAL. Okay, so hopefully I'm not offending anybody here. Notice the other day, a student of postdoc talked about the spherical lion. Now, now I'm a little bit worried about using the word spherical cow and cow, but anyway, never mind. So this is really one of the first experiments to show or, or have a phenomenon where gravity and quantum mechanics were combined. So in this experiment, they had a Moxender interferometer made of a pure piece of uh, crystalline silicon. The particles that they were sending through were neutrons. This, this thing, which is drawn here, can fit in, this, in your hands. It's a very small interferometer. That's really all you need to, to uh, get an effect. So in this experiment, what they did is they had this interferometer, and they rotated it in the, in the vertical direction. And what does this do? Well, as you rotate it, say it's vertical like this, the neutrons that take the upper path have a different gravitational potential energy from the neutrons that take the lower path. And so you get a phase difference in the wave function. And so just by rotating this, this interferometer, this angle phi here is the angle to the horizontal. So clearly when phi is equal to zero, you're not going to get any phase shift because the paths have the same potential energy. But as you rotate it, you get uh, multiple oscillations in the phase shift. So the, the, the phase difference goes like the area circumscribed by the neutrons and the velocity of the neutrons, the mass of the neutrons, and, and gravity. And so as I said, it's enough to have an area of the, of the order of uh, like a, a 10 centimeters squared in order to get a measurable effect. One thing that's really remarkable about this formula is that it depends on the mass, the gravitational mass of the neutrons. The only force that's at work here is gravity. And we know that in classical physics, if you talk about dynamics, Newton's equation, F equals ma, if F is equal to mg, the m's cancel out, a equals g, mass doesn't enter. This is the equivalence principle. But it does in quantum mechanics. So this is a rather interesting observation. 
one thing that I'm always struck by these days is that when you, you encounter papers in your field, they never describe the process by which results were obtained. Somehow we excise out the, the color and the, you know, the, the, the dead ends and everything. It would be wonderful to have papers where we actually learn about how the calculations or the results were, were, achieved, were, got, were, were arrived at. Well, I want to give you a little bit of the flavor of this. Unfortunately, it's a little hard to see. So I, I obtained from Sam Werner, he just turned 80 recently, the original um, data from that experiment. This is a piece of graph paper. They took a pencil. They just used a pencil to plot the, um, the uh, count differences between the two uh, paths. And so this is, this is the actual data from that experiment. OK. So, so far, we've, we've seen an experiment where classical gravity um, plays a role in quantum matter interference. Let's go a little bit closer to, to quantum fluctuations of gravity as well. So here's a, an idealization of, of that uh, neutron interferometry experiment. It turns out that there's a very beautiful, and I think it is the fundamental way to understand that phase difference. It's due to, to Daniel Greenberger. It, you can describe the phase shift as, as a kind of a twin paradox in the sense that uh, Neutrons in the lower path age less in a, in a, a sort of a given uh, amount of uh, time in the lab, for relative to time in the lab frame, compared to neutrons going in the upper path. And so you can start with an expression looking like this. The phase difference is given by the, the, the rest energy and the proper time experienced by that neutron as it's going through, or that wave component as it's going through the interferometer. And of course, the neutron masses are, are fixed, and the speed of light, of course, is fixed. So you can pull these out, so you can write the phase shift like this. Now, with a little bit of um, undergraduate special relativity, we're on Earth. We can, we can describe the metric in the usual way, it's a, the kind of where, where, we, where we have a, just a weak gravitational field. If you substitute that into the proper time expressed in the, the lab frame uh, coordinate time, you expand this because, of course, um, the velocity of these neutrons is, is much less than C. And you get, after it's some algebra, exactly the, the right formula that I showed you in the beginning. And so Daniel Greenberger argues, and I agree with him, that uh, really the, the, the fundamental way to understand um, neutron interferometry in a gravitational field is, is through uh, the twin paradox, differences in proper time experienced by the um, neutrons, uh, depending on which path they're going on, their wave functions. So why, why have I shown you that um, formulation of, of the phase shift? Well, suppose instead of neutrons, you are now considering some composite mass particle going through the interferometer. It could be a, um, a, a molecule. It could be a, a one of these uh, rubidium-87 atoms. It could be a piece of uh, a tiny micrometer piece of silicon crystal. Not worry about how to achieve this interferometer, but let's just suppose we are able to, to, to um, send um, particles of arbitrary size through a Mach center interferometer where the wave components experience different um, uh, gravitational potential energies, or more appropriately, different proper times. OK. Now, just thinking heuristically, I'm not giving you any formulae at the moment right, right now, but Let's think about how gravity might cause dephasing or decoherence, a destruction of this phase shift. Well, it can, it can maybe affect it in two ways. One of the ways is that you, you might have a nearby mass, like a Cavendish mass, that's, that it's itself, it's, of course, it's quantum, it's fluctuating, so it produces a fluctuating gravitational field. So the proper time fluctuates. Another way is that you might have a thermal graviton bath, just, just for simplicity. And again, this might uh, give rise to fluctuations. One should also point out that if this is a composite system, take, take myself at the moment, I'm suffering from a cold. My weight is probably a little bit more than it was yesterday because my temperature is higher than yesterday. In the same way, if you take a composite mass system, the mass will fluctuate. And so you should properly think of this, this cosine of the phase difference as a fluctuating quantity. So you should take the average of it. And if it's a Gaussian distributed just for, this, for the argument, 
think of the arguments, then you get a, a term like this, so you get decoherence. How am I doing for time, by the way? Okay. So keep that in mind, keep that picture in mind. We have an interferometer. Gravity is present, it may be fluctuating in some way. And it's fruitful to have a proper time formulation of the interference. So I want to slightly digress from that and consider a system which, where there is no gravity, but there's something analogous to gravity. So here we have two mechanical oscillators. These are, these are 10 micrometer long vibrating beams. This is, by the way, an ex experiment from Andrew Clayland's group. Uh, from, the, from the late 90s. So think of this as like a, the two arms of an interferometer. And let's suppose there's some way to have atoms that, that or, or molecules that can be guided along these arms and then interfere here, and they have a source over here. So again, don't worry about how to realize this. This is really more of a thought experiment. Now there's something remarkable about nanomechanical oscillators, and I really put it all down here. It's very feasible to have like a, a vibrating wire of a, about 100 megahertz. This is a mechanical oscillator. It's vibrating at 100 megahertz with an amplitude of one nanometer. So what's the acceleration that you would experience if you were the atom that were kind of sitting on that surface, kind of being guided along? Well, that's just simple harmonic oscillator analysis. It's just the omega squared times the amplitude. It's 10 to the 9 meters per second squared. Is huge. And in fact, this is actually not far from the uh, G force experienced on the surface of a neutron star, a small neutron star. So this suggests that this can be kind of a, a useful analog for studying the effects of gravity on interfer interference, matter interference, and I could argue even quantum gravity through the equivalence principle. Because this behaves like a non-inertial reference frame. So think of this as fixed. So it's, it's not vibrating, but this one's oscillating. So when the, when the atoms or the molecules are going through, if they go through here, they're going through a non-inertial oscillating reference frame. So they, they experience a, a, a shorter proper time. They're younger when they come out compared to when they're coming out, going, the wave function's going through this way. Now, this is not a, a uniform acceleration, it's an oscillating acceleration, but, but that's just really a detail. But, but what you have here is essentially through the equivalence principle, something very analogous to the COW experiment. But this is where it gets really interesting, because we know how to make these to be in quantum states. I just showed you so, uh, the experiment from um, Teufel and Lennart, where they had a vibrating drum. We can also make these vibrating wires to be in quantum states. We could in principle, put them in a superposition of two positions or a spread of energies. But what that means is that the atoms are experiencing a kind of a quantum non-inertial reference frame. And through the equivalence principle, this is a little bit like quantum gravity. Um, not, not here. I mean, there will be thermal fluctuations, of course. There's no gravity here. So I'm just, just invoking the equivalence principle and the fact that it's very natural to think of these as non-inertial reference frames. And furthermore, it's, it's also, with a bit of stretching, it's natural to think of these as in quantum, quantum states as well. These, these will be quantum fluctuations, but, but mostly, they won't, of course, be mimicking exactly whatever the gravitational fluctuations are. But, but in some sense, this is, this is more than an analog, because through the equivalence principle, you are, in some sense, creating a, a fluctuating proper time, which is exactly what I talked about, how gravity might play a role if you treat it quantum mechanically. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, with the Rindler, you have a, a constant proper acceleration, whereas this is a sinusoidal acceleration. Um, it's, so it's always coming back to its starting point. I mean, as an interesting aside, um, you can also think about other applications for this extreme acceleration. So what if you had two, two, two level detectors here? 
probably know what I'm talking about, the Unruh effect. You know, so if you had two level systems here, if you had enough of them, then maybe uh, you know, the, the signal to noise is good enough that you can actually uh, measure Unruh effect. But it, you have to do the calculation for sinusoidal detectors, detectors that's accelerating sinusoidally. And in fact, Bailot Koo and, and uh, uh, some others calculated that a few years ago. So, so this, is, this is really the, uh, the scheme that I've been telling you about in words. So it's, it's just stripping away the complexity. So what I have in mind here is that you have a, a two-path interferometer. One arm is fixed. The other is accelerating. But you can treat this as a, as a quantum variable if you want. And it's very easy to calculate the effect on the phase difference just using Newton's equ uh, Schrodinger equation, just two couple oscillators. But, and you get a result that you get the phasing of the dwell time of the particle or atom or what have you in this non-inertial frame is uh, greater than, much greater than uh, h bar over the uncertainty of the atom that's induced from the fluctuating reference frame. A little bit of the Penrose uh, kind of, looks a little bit like the Penrose uh, formula, but, but that's just, you know, it's a little bit too early to draw conclusions there. This is something that uh, hasn't, hasn't been calculated yet, but as I pointed out, you can, you can equivalently describe this phase shift as a, as a proper time difference, the twin paradox. And so it should be possible to, to derive the same result. I didn't show you the calculations earlier, but using the proper time formalism. And this is just really a formal expression, some time ordering in the lab time coordinate, where there, there must be a way to make sense of this to get the right result on the left-hand side, where you're treating this as a quantum proper time operator. So it's in this sense that this, this uh, through the equivalence principle, this analog might shed light on how to treat um, genuine uh, quantum reference frames. OK, back to gravity. So as I said earlier, one way in which you might get dephasing is if you have a thermal graviton bow. And this is what I'm going to look at in the rest of the talk. Of course, there are very other interesting uh, things that should be addressed or investigated. For example, if you have a nearby mass that's in a superposition of two positions, this was actually talked about by Tierf and, and maybe a few others, what effect does that have on, on a quantum particle nearby? But I'm not going to talk about that here. So we're going to try to model a, a, a macroscopic matter system uh, in the presence of a thermal graviton bath. For simplicity, we'll assume that the bath is at, at some, uh, it's a thermal equilibrium. That's just for simplicity. And what we have here is just an open quantum system. Our system is going to be uh, uh, describing the matter. So this will, I'm going to use a massive scalar field as, as my spherical tiger for this. And the, and the environment is going to come from gravity. So anybody who's done calculations of decoherence calculations of open quantum systems, you properly to come up with a decoherence result, you have to quantize both the system and the environment. And you might say, well, how can I do that? I don't have a quantum theory of gravity. Well, there is some hope. And this is due largely to John Donahue, who has shown very effectively that as long as the phenomenon that you're studying is, has low energy, weak curvature, then in many situations you can make sense of perturbative quantum gravity, treating it as a, as a low energy effective field theory. So the idea there is that you, you include higher order terms in your Lagrangian, which are consistent with the symmetries, the general coordinate invariants, and so on. And the infinities that you get are local because they're ultraviolet affinities, and you can hide them in parameters that you measure in the experiment. And what remains in your theory are things that you can make predictions with. So we don't need full quantum gravity because we're not trying to describe the Big Bang or what happens near black hole singularity. Neither is it sufficient to work with classical GR or quantum matter on a fixed curved space-time background. We need to make the, the, the background dynamical. John Donahue has shown that you can use low energy effective field theory to calculate the correction to the Newtonian 1 over r squared force. He's also, with his group, calculated the quantum correction due to gravity for bending of light by a star and many others. What I'm advocating is that you can also apply 
low energy effective field theory approach to gravitational induced decoherence. Why? Well, because I'm talking about masses in a lab. I'm not talking about strong curvature situations. So this is just a snapshot of some papers which are kind of in the flavor of this effective field theory approach. Let's, the rest of the talk, I just want to go through some of the, uh, the algebra for this, just to give you a flavor for the calculations that are involved. And let me just, just give you a, a kind of a proviso here that this is my first attempt. And when you carry out first attempts, there are things that you might have overlooked. So I'm not complaining. I'm not claiming that this, this is correct. Right? So I'm maybe sticking my neck out saying this, but, but this, is, this is just the first attempt. And let's just see what it looks like. So the system is a scalar field. This is our spherical line approximation for describing a silicon uh, bit of microsphere or something like that. The environment is gravity. We are only interested in low, weak curvature situations. This is low energy. So we can, I mean, as I claimed, you can use perturbative quantum gravity meaningfully uh, in, in, in principle. So we're going to perturb about Minkowski for simplicity. And the coupling that, that, that dictates the uh, order of the expansion is kappa, which is related, which is given up here. So I'm only going to quadratic order in the, the environment fields. This is the metric, H, B, and U. The uh, system action is the, the, you know, the, the, the recognizable massive scalar field action. The interaction between the system and the environment takes a rather interesting form. So you, if you like, you can invoke what you've learned about uh, open quantum systems in, in less exotic situations. What you have here is, is a system that's quadratic in the field, an environment that's linear in the field in the interaction. I'm going to neglect this term because it doesn't play a role in what I'm going to be talking about today. So we want to derive a master equation to describe the uh, scalar field dynamics. And there's a convenient approach called the feynman vernon influence action approach, where all the, the, all the effects of the graviton, thermal graviton bath are contained in this, this action right here. If you go through the algebra, and there are many missing steps here, you get this master equation that looks like this. Again, it's useful to think about simpler systems, like an oscillator system called, coupled to an oscillator bath. Think of this as like the oscill free oscillator dynamics, harmonic oscillator dynamics. And then you get two terms which are, have a counterpart in open a quantum oscillator system where you've got a, a noise term and a diffusion term. Sorry, uh, yes, noise and dissipation term. So the noise term is the one that's responsible for dephasing or decoherence. Dissipation, if it's non-zero, of course, will give you damping. And as I said, we're assuming for simplicity that the, the graviton bath is thermal. And gravitons being bosons, you have a Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay. Now, we want to somehow um, model um, macroscopic superpositions of, of like a piece of crystalline silicon or a molecule or an atom. How do we do that with our spherical line model? Well, we have a massive scalar field. It's free, apart from coupling to, uh, to gravity. One way to do this is to construct a, a coherent field state which is given here. And the best way to understand the state is to take an expectation value of the field operator. If you do that with these special states, what you have is essentially a, a spherical bowl of, of energy density. So this is literally our spherical cow approximation. I apologize. I have to use that. So this is, if you like, our model of a of a uh, piece of crystalline silicon that's in the lab that you put in the superposition of two positions or energies. Now, we can play around with several things. We can play around with the radius of these, these spheres. We can play around with the, if you like, the energy density. And so this is the radius, the energy density, and also the location in Minkowski space. Uh, you know, the, the, this thermal graviton background does give us a preferred reference frame, although it's translationally invariant. Now, we don't want to have these bowls being kind of dispersing away as, as soon as we made them, because that, that's not what happens to a piece of crystalline silicon. We don't want to model the inter, interatomic uh, interactions. So the way we get around this is we make the bowl radius much larger than the Compton wavelength. 
given by the, the mass uh, the mass of the, the um, particles making the scalar field. And what this means is that if you create one of these bulls, it'll disperse very slowly. And so on the time scale of any dephasing, the idea is that it, it'll still remain roughly spherical. And it won't move by very much. So we want to make superposition states. So that's easy. You just take two of these kind of coherent state bases. We can displace them in position. We can also make superpositions of energy as well. Might as well consider both possibilities. And so this is what this would look like if we uh, looked at the expectation value of the field operator. So when we take such initial states, they're non-relativistic. We can simplify the form of mass circulation considerably. And all I'm showing you here is the diffusion term, which governs dissipation, uh, governs decoherence, dephasing. And if you take that expression and pick out the decoherence rate, decoherence time, you get the following result. So if you were able to produce such a superposition state, then it would survive depending on this formula here for, for a rate uh, which is governed by this expression. So it depends on the energy difference in the superposition. So this is the energy of, say, this, this part of the superposition. This is the energy of this part of the superposition. There's a, there's a natural energy scale, which is the Planck energy, which goes in the denominator. So this is quadratic. And then there's a temperature dependence, which appears on the outside here. No, this is rest mass energy. I, I will talk a little bit more about the nature of the energy shortly. Now, let me just point out that this expression here is, is, is uh, valid only in the long time limit because that's the easiest calculation to do. And it's a little bit strange what constitutes the long time limit in this system. It's not taking uh, um, um, uh, anyway, I'll stop there. But the long time limit is given by this expression here. I've just put that in my state. This, this is my initial condition, and, and this is possible. I, let, let me get to that shortly. I'll give you some more concrete examples. So, apologize, my, my uh, sleep, lack of sleep last night is kind of making appearance now, but I'll, I'll try to be as clear as possible. So, so this is the high temperature limit. Now, usually the high temperature limit, you have KT much larger than some energy scale, like H bar omega, it was a harmonic oscillator. Here, the high temperature limit is connected to how long you wait before you, you do the calculation. So, Prior to this kind of dephasing, there's, a, there's a, going to be a power law dephasing uh, which, which kicks in earlier, and I haven't calculated that. So this is, this is only the late time dephasing rate. Now, one thing that we found, or I, I found, uh, is that if you only have, if, you, if these are, have exactly the same energy, but they're spatially, um, uh, it's a spatial superposition, you get no decoherence. So, so gravity, according to this calculation, only picks up energy differences in the superposition. This is actually similar to a result that was found by Karas Anastopoulos and Bailout Koo roughly at the same time. So this may be touching a little bit more on uh, what was asked uh, some of the questions recently. So I, I use a spherical cow approximation for, just for, for modeling this formula, but if we allow to extrapolate a bit and say argue that this expression applies to any, any energy supervision, any matter distribution, what we can take is, for example, a uh, um, a hydrogen atom, imagine you have a hydrogen atom that's in the superposition of the 1s and the 2s state. So just to get a sense of the numbers, what is the decoherence uh, rate? It's, it's very small. But as you start to increase the number of atoms in your, in your in this case, a gas, and you have a state which is uh, like all atoms are in the ground state, superposed with all atoms in the excited state, the decoherence rate starts to go uh, up. Now, at this moment, I'm not claiming that we can do this experiment because nobody has ever managed to make a superposition of a one kilogram mass where every atom's in the ground state and every atom in the excited state. This is really an in principle calculation. In principle, does gravity play a role? Worry about experiments later. Yes. So I assumed one Kelvin. 
I asked Robert Caldwell, is that reasonable to assume based on what we understand of the inflationary epoch? And he said, it is reasonable, but I'm not claiming that that's actually right, just to get some numbers. So back to analogies again. Analogies do have a use in helping us understand uh, more complicated theories. The analogies are simpler. It turns out that there's a very similar kind of uh, dephasing rate for this, this model or this system that uh, uh, many groups now have realized in the lab. This is an optomechanical system where you have a, a cavity with, with a, a, a photon mode and then you have a mechanical membrane that couples via radiation pressure. This is something that I talked about at the very beginning. So here the analogy is that you can think of the optical mode as like the mechanical system and the, all the modes of this floppy large membrane is like the gravitons. The phonons are like the gravitons. And why is there an analogy? Well, it's because radiation proper pressure couples via the energy, okay, just like that, that gravitational matter interaction did. Now, it turns out that you can actually solve this model exactly. And uh, some of the early work on this was done by Sugato Bose, and he might actually talk a little bit about it straight after me. So, we just assume a simple ohmic bath spectral density. This is for the phonon modes in the mechanical membrane, like the gravitons. You can calculate the dephasing, the, 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 how the density matrix evolves in time. And this is, again, a uh, high temperature limit. It's exactly the same as for, for the gravity case. And this is the term that, that has a direct car counterpart to what I showed you for the gravity case. This bit right here is the early dephasing that happens uh, uh, when T was less than this term. So there's an initial period of uh, parallel decay followed by exponential decay. Notice that this initial period of decay depends on the upper cutoff, um, whereas this does not. And I'll say a bit more about that shortly. So this just captures uh, graphically that formula. Depending on um, how large the temperature is, the, the longer you have to wait and so you have more uh, dephasing in the power low case, but then eventually goes into the exponential decay, the exponential case. So what I've calculated is, is the late time deco decoherence, but, but it, what hasn't been calculated is what happens at the early stages, which is, the, if you like, the low temperature limit. Okay, second to last slide. Um, open problems, and this, this really touches what, uh, back to a comment I made, a proviso at the beginning that, uh, you know, this is my first attempt. I derived a master equation. I picked out the dephasing decoherence by looking at a particular term in the master equation. But one thing we're told about in general relativity is it's extremely important to try to come up with gauge invariant ways to do your calculations because it's very easy for gauge dependent effects, coordinate dependent effects to slip in. And so ideally you would like to have a kind of a mock Zender type uh, setup where you have an initial state that you prepared at early times and then you have a detector at the end and everything happens with gravity in between rather than just picking out the dephasing at a particular coordinate time. So I have some ideas about how to do this, uh, which I won't go into. I didn't consider uh, the effect of graviton emission absorption for decoherence. I didn't look at the early time where low temperature decoherence, which will be power low decay. We found this interesting result that uh, um, Gravity dephases energy, energy superposition differences, so not spatial differences. Well, maybe if we break translational symmetry and imagine having a background, say, of the Earth, so there's a, there's a kind of breaking translational invariance in the radial direction, you will get decoherence in spatial superposition. So that remains to be done. My final comment is more of a philosophical comment. This is all about decoherence, okay, whereas we've heard a number of talks about collapse. So I would like to argue that Suppose it wasn't even possible in principle to distinguish between decoherence and collapse because you couldn't capture the correlations in the gravitational environment. Then you might argue that this undecidability essentially dictates that you might as well call this collapse okay, because there's no way to distinguish the two. But what you have now is the possibility of, of a, a quantitative way to calculate collapse. So what, the way this might work is you might take this decoherence formula and construct a collapse model that gives you the same result. But this is really my point of, of a certain point of view I have, and you may disagree with it. You just take it as, it, as what I said. Final slide. We know that gravity is very weak. 
But also quantum coherence is incredibly fragile. This is why it's so hard to build a quantum computer. And so when people argue that gravity is so weak, it can't possibly pay or play a role. Well, I would argue that maybe it does, because it's really the, the competition between the weakness of gravity and this extreme fragility of quantum coherence. Thank you very much. Hello? Uh, any questions? Yeah. So just, just a quick question. So in, if everything depends just on energy, and in your final formula is the mass never actually appears, does that mean we could apply the same reasoning to, to photons? So maybe try and look at these effects. So quant uh, gravity induced so Max Maxwell, put Maxwell in the, matter, in the, in the uh, energy side or in the other side of the... Probably you can, if you can, but I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I, I was intrigued by the fact that you have to include a temperature here, and you still want to call it a collapse. I was wondering, when you go to zero temperature... Well, this corresponds to early time. So there's always some finite temperature if you assume thermal equilibrium for simplicity. So if you go to early times, then, then the temperature drops out. It's just a parallel decay depending on the cutoff condition. So if you're saying even at zero temperature you'd get this effect, does that mean that it... So for the, um, for the optomechanical system, you do, actually. Um, what, I, I forgot to say this. I assumed a product state. I think I've said that in the second to last slide, between the system and the environment. And that's, of course, very artificial. It's really for calculation purposes. And it could be that initial parallel decay, which is quite, can be quite significant if temperature is low, because you have to wait longer to get out of it, is, is a consequence of having a product state. Whereas if you took a more realistic state where the system and, and the environment, gravity or the phonons, have, have a time to get to know each other, then maybe, maybe that there isn't that initial parallel. <coughs> then, then your question has to be reevaluated. No, the, the worrying fact was that your the neutron mass, the gravitational mass, um, appears in your phase difference. Yes. This is now, the COW experiment. Yeah. Right. So I was wondering how did you, how does that happen? Because the, neither the Newtonian gravity or not the Einstein gravity could bring in the gravitational mass. Because what is the neutron mass dependent? What has gone wrong somewhere? I don't know if people really understand. I mean, I think Daniel Greenberger has some thoughts about, he's written some papers not looking only at. No, I, I mean, in, in principle, where from it came? Did it, the, your application of the quantum theory had some uh, effect on the gravity or where? How, how, how did this happen? Well, it, it's. Because the, um, I mean, the, the, the dominant effects is, is, if you think about it in terms of poten gravitational potential energy, it's the fact that you have different gravitational potential energies for the upper path versus the lower path. And it goes like mg, z, or mgh. Um, and there's nothing to cancel out that m from anywhere. I, I haven't, honestly, I haven't thought about it much, but I just look at it and I'm just that, amazed. That, that's, that's a really worrying thing. Where, how, how did this so I have uh, two questions. Uh, what was the motivation to take the m square phi square potential? Like uh, the, the scalar do... field? Yeah. Uh, because it's the simplest field theory that models matter that I could think of. I mean, in the you know, in a, to be more realistic, you'd want to have a way to bind the field to itself, like have maybe phi to the fourth or something, because then it gets too complicated. But you could have taken some other potential also, and probably the well, results don't. Well, it's, a sim it's, a, it's just a quadratic. Uh, System, so it's it's a free scalar field. It's, it's just the simplest possible spherical cow. Mm -hmm. So instead of a spherical cow, suppose you have something which is squeezed. Ah. Then you will have some dispersions coming in. Yeah. So. And you, then probably your phase shift will also get some higher order effects. Yeah. Not just from the point particle, mm -hmm. but from the spin coupling of the yeah. of the cow with the connection. 
fermionic mass, you could take a Dirac field. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you take a Dirac field, then certainly there will be this extra coupling. I, you know, I, I don't know if uh, uh, John Donahue has actually considered uh, coupling a Dirac field to gravity in, in this effective field theory because it's, it's really light or, or scalar matter. It's actually quite, I mean, it's quite non-trivial to uh, quantize a Dirac field and, and even fix curve space time back. Frame and everything. Okay, uh, so the time's up. So